This tube is an 813. I most often encountered it in audio systems, although I did run a transmitter where a pair of these were drivers for the RF section. It's a pentode, which means it has three grids. But unlike most audio tubes, this one has a the filament, the heater, is also the cathode. As I said, most often I encountered this in audio situations. And the way that's done, the filament AC supply via a transformer. The, the, the secondary of the transformer is center tapped. And that center tap is used as the cathode. So as far as AC goes, it's balanced about the center tap and cancels out in the heater. There's a large metallic plate. It's a rectangle with uh, two seams. And support ceramic support pillars on both sides. The actual grid structure is hidden by the plate. To maintain somewhat dimensional stability of the heater, there's a pair of springs on the upper end of the tube. They're serving to apply some vertical tension or some tension to the incandescent wire that forms the heating element. These two pins are larger than any of the rest. But normally the socket that this plugged into had a metal sleeve over it. And the sole purpose of that was to locate this pin in a groove in the socket. You could rotate the tube around until the pin fits down in the slot. That prevents some yahoo from just inserting it the wrong way even though these two large pins would prevent that. The pin is a very common locating element in these kind of tubes. This is something we always saw when we read the tube data back in the 50s to 70s two ratings. This stood for continuous commercial service. Continuous was defined as anything more than eight hours a day. This is intermittent commercial and amateur service. And you see for continuous service everything's a little more conservative. Plate dissipation is 67 watts instead of 100 watts. This was good for 180 continuous watts or 300 watts intermittent service. So in continuous commercial service, which would be like AM broadcast, the tubes lasted a lot longer than they did in amateur service. But they may have lasted longer in amateur service, measured in years rather than hours of operation. As I say, I most often ran into this tube in audio situations, especially in uh, church sound systems. And if there was a problem, it wasn't with the tube. After all, they were only driven on Sundays. This is a very interesting tube. I found a few of these in uh, laboratory equipment that required regulated high voltage power supplies. Today we regulate power supplies with either brute force transistors or use a switching power supply with a feedback loop to regulate voltage. This was a vacuum tube used in a brute force setup. However much 
energy needed to be removed from the power supply in order to maintain the output. It was turned into heat in this tube. This is a uh, 7242. The tube itself is made by tongue sole. This data sheet is also tongue sole and it's a tentative data sheet. It's dated January 1, 59. This is a triode. One plate, one control grid, and three indirectly heated cathodes. I'm still not sure why. I would guess that maybe they put a resistor low, low value in series with each cathode to equalize current. Earlier in this series I presented a triode, a dual triode, with a single cathode. That was the uh, 6J6. This is the other way around. It's a single triode with three cathodes. And here is the plate structure. Okay, the plate is this, well, it's, it's two pieces, two identical pieces, left and right. And it's uh, compressed graphite with what's supposed to be a zirconium coating. And then sandwiched between it, I don't know if you make that out or not, but that's the grid and the grid is spans its support from here the whole way over here so the entire middle or space between the two plates is occupied by the grid it's one grid then inside the grid and I don't think we'll be able to see it here See, the white wires are the heater wires. The heater wires are inside the three cathodes. And you can see there's a white wire over, a pair of white wires here, a pair of white wires here, a pair of white wires here. Then, if you can see it, there's a thin band comes down here. That's connected to the cathode, the center cathode. This little thin wire right here, not this big thick wire, is, is one of the cathodes. And the other cathode I can't really discern. This plate is able to withstand, or able to radiate, a large amount of heat. They actually glow red in the centers at high high dissipation. This tube really didn't live very long as tubes go, perhaps 20 years. This is a very commonly found statement in the instructions for designing a circuit for high power vacuum tube. They want the cathode or the filament to be warmed up completely before voltage is applied. A very popular way of providing a time delay was this time delay relay. This was made by Amperite and it's a very, very common uh, to find one of these. This is 115 volt normally open or form A contact and this one I believe is good for 15 seconds. And what it consists of are two 
parallel metal plates, set of contacts on the end. One of the plates is heated and the heating wires are on this side of the plate going back and forth insulated by a sheet of mica. Now one or both of these sheets is bimetallic and they bend towards each other being heated. So this is a thermally activated time delay relay and since we have to heat this thing up before the contacts close and the filament or cathode is a heat related structure on a vacuum tube this would be used to delay the application of the plate voltage now in this data sheet you can see that these things are available in a form A or a form B the difference between the fact that an A is open and a B is closed the contacts are rated 3 amps and the 9 pin tube which is the one I have is shown schematically here